Chapter two. Chapter two is all about the cell. So we're going to talk about cell biology in general terms, what all of the organelles are, the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and then after that we're going to get into some specifics of membrane-bound transport, diffusion, osmosis, other things that cells do. This seems like review maybe from a gen bio class you might have had one at one point. It's so important to physiology. All physiology is, is what specific cells are doing in given tissues. That's really all it is. So it's very, very practical to go over cell biology again. Remember what all those organelles were, what they were doing, because it's going to come up again and again and again. Uh, my favorite way to review cells is actually to model them in clay. I found last semester when I had my students take a moment, get out some literal Play-Doh, and model the cells, build them yourself, the test scores went way up on the cell biology content. So again, it seems like kindergarten, but it really, really works to do that. So if you have clay at home, play around with it, model a cell for yourself. I've also given you a coloring book page. It's already up under course documents in the student portal. It's so useful to do. So our chapter two outlined the study of cells, the prototypical cell, the plasma membrane, cytoplasm nucleus, a life cycle of the cell, and aging of the cell. Remember that life cycle, mitosis? Got to cover some mitosis today as well. Pretty simplified version though, not too much detail. So cytology, cyte is the prefix that means cell. Anytime you see the word cyte, you're referring to cells. Uh, they will only be visible by microscopy. They are measured in micrometers. Sometimes we just call those microns. This is the Greek letter mu right here. That's a mu. Uh, that refers to micro. Sizes vary from 7 microns to 120 microns for the oocyte. The RBC refers to red blood cells. Uh, there are even larger, uh, actually egg cells I think are the largest single cells cells. The chicken egg, as you know, that is not one cell. That is made up of multiple cells at that point. Shapes vary from flat, cylindrical, oval, and irregular in shape. We have names for each of those shapes. You're going to hear the word squamous a lot in the next couple of weeks, for example. So again, size scale for individual cells. Here we are in the cell range. Human oocyte being towards the high end for a single cell. Ostrich egg, multiple cells at that point. Um, mitochondria is an organelle within a cell. You're going to get that at around the one micron mark. Three types of microscopy. Understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at microscopic images. This is a light microscope. This is transmission electron microscopy, TEM. This is scanning electron microscopy, or SEM image. So transmission is going to get you kind of a slice through an image. The electrons are going through these things. The scanning electron microscope, the electrons are bouncing off of the image to tell us what is viewed at very, very, very small sizes. Uh, it's only with uh, SEM or TEM that we can visualize things that are almost molecular in nature, seeing things that are specific to the plasma membrane with electron microscopy at this point. It's very impressive. These are all demonstrating cilia at different magnifications. So you can see the vagueness of cilia under the light microscope and the intense magnification that you get with transmission electron microscopy. Next week we start with histology. You're going to see this sort of pink and purple coloring a lot. Anytime it's pink and purple like that, it's called something called an h and &E stain. Uh, it's the most common stain for human tissues. What it means is the purple stuff is proteins. There's a lot of protein going on when you see a purple nucleus like that. The pink one, the clear one, clear is more likely to be fluid filled. Pink has less protein. There's something else going on with it. It's very simple to read, very simple to look at. We'll see a lot of H and E images. Okay, good there. Covered all of that. The cell functions in any number of ways, and cells are differentiated is what we're going to find. Your cells, they all contain the same genetic information, but it's going to be expressed differently to cover different functions. In certain cells, you're going to need a protective covering or lining. 
those cells may need junctions between cells to anchor them down in a, in a solid way, in a sturdy way. Uh, storage movement, they might have, for example, cilia, we just saw on the last slide. They may need to move something in the external environment. They may, may need to move themselves. For example, sperm cells have a flagella that allows for movement. Connections, defense, your white blood cells, for example, are going to need to travel around the body and be able to invade tissues to um, to eat invaders or destroy invaders in some way. Some of them will communicate with other body parts, uh, usually chemical communication. They're going to produce chemicals that are going to go to other cells and cause changes in those other cells. And of course, reproduction, our gamete cells, our oocytes, our sperm. Okay, kind of going over exactly what we just said. Where are oh, zooming in on this? This is an epithelium, so this is going to be a protective covering right here. This one's going to have a little bit of, um, looks like we've got some goblet cells in there. That's a kind of cell that secretes a mucus product. That's a spe cell specialization. There's a white blood cell, part of our immune system, part of our defense. There's a neuron, so electrical activity that causes communication from one neuron to the next and so forth. Uh, skeletal muscle right there for contractility, movement, warmth. Here's our structure of a cell. So you can use this in reference for your coloring page. We will have a nucleus. We will have a plasma membrane and we will have cytosol. And cytosol is also known as, let's see, intracellular fluid is another name for it. It's got a few different names. Cytosol is just the stuff inside the cell. It includes all of these membrane-bound organelles. It includes the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria, the centrum, centrioles, sorry, the um, secretory vesicles, various types of vesicles that we'll cover. So this will be your best reference for your coloring book page. Not all Cells will have microtubules, not all will have cilia. Uh, sorry, not, not microtubules. Uh, not all will have flagella, not all will have cilia, not all will have microvilli. Those are all possibilities. This is our standardized cell. What we'll find is that each and every cell is going to look a little bit differently, but have all of these components. And that's what's important about to understand there. So the prototypical cell, has plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and nucleus. The nucleus is the control center of the cell. I'm pretty sure you've got some review questions somewhere in there. I think your book likes to stress this one. It's like the brain of the cell. It's the control center. It contains the DNA, your genetic information, all of your DNA. It's just a blueprint for proteins. It's a blueprint for the stuff that's going to be built in the cell. That's what makes it the control center. The cytoplasm, all of the organelles, all of the membrane, all of the fluid, that's your cytoplasm. And then the plasma membrane just holds it all together. Now there's a lot going on in the plasma membrane. We're going to spend a lot of time on physiology that involves plasma membranes, especially integral proteins, especially this type of thing, channels. Uh, peripheral por proteins are important. Cholesterol plays a role in the fluidity of the plasma membrane. Even glycoproteins, these little glucose, these sugars that are bound to this protein play a very important role in keeping fluid in this environment. One concept you see a lot in biology is like attracts like, and this is a hydrophilic head of this phospholipid this is a phospholipid bilayer. Each of these circles repre represents the uh, charge, the polar, the hydrophilic head of the phospholipid. And all of these tails pointing towards this midline in the bilayer, they're hydrophobic. They repel water, oil and water, quite literally, right? So this is your oily layer. This is your lipid layer. This is your watery layer. And then having more hydrophilic sugars in this group keeps water in this zone. You keep water in this zone with this hydrophilic region. You keep water out of this zone. 
So this is going to make it selectively permeable. This is a selectively permeable barrier. Things are going to come in and out only as this membrane allows for it. If we need something larger to come through, we're going to have a channel for it or a gated ligand of some kind or a pump of some kind, depending on a number of factors that we'll get to later. So there is our integral protein that allows for communication between these two environments selectively. And one type of molecule is going to be able to pass through the plasma membrane on its own, and that is small nonpolar molecules. We will go into more detail on this in a bit. So yeah, uh, gases may be able to diffuse through if they're small enough. Nutrients only if they're small and nonpolar. Wastes, again, uh, you may need some sort of mechanism for getting larger scale wastes in or out of the cell. So phospholipid bilayer, cholesterol, the role of cholesterol, as I said, it's maintaining the fluidity of the plasma membrane. It's actually very interesting. When things get very cold, the plasma membrane is going to want to freeze. It's a very fluid environment. Uh, it wants to solidify it, freeze. If the cell freezes, then the cell is going to die, unfortunately. So cholesterol is actually going to make it more fluid when it's cold. And then in very hot environments, when the plasma membrane starts to begin to melt, as fluids and fats will in high temperatures, the cholesterol actually helps solidify it. It's kind of like what antifreeze does for your car. It's a very interesting molecule. So you do nutritionally need cholesterol. It is important for every single cell in your body. It keeps you from freezing and it keeps you from melting. And that's perfect, right? We need that. Glycolipids, glycoproteins, as we were talking about here, these attract water to this extracellular environment and hold it there. Like attracts like, water is polar, these are polar, it's going to keep water in this environment. Proteins can be integral or peripheral, which is to say they can be going all the way through. Integral proteins go all the way through the plasma membrane. Peripheral proteins will be anchored in generally on one side. Or on the other or associated with an integral protein. So those integral may be channels or they may just be going all the way through. Peripheral are not going to go all the way through the plasma membrane. So again the polar regions exposed to water, the nonpolar regions face each other forming an internal core of the membrane. Mm -hmm. Yep, did that. Uh, we'll worry about the glycocalyx when you guys get to microbio. Don't have to worry about it here. Covered that. So again, integral proteins, peripheral proteins. They'll have a number of different functions depending on what they are. It's all about how that protein folds that's going to indicate what it actually does, what role it has to play. We're going to see all kinds of membrane-bound proteins in AMP1, AMP2, and pathophysiology. Enzymes are one possibility for a peripheral protein. What is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein. They're always made of protein. They have a job to do. They have a specific job to do. Usually it's going to be building something up or a different enzyme may have the job of breaking something down. So synthesis or lysis. Synthesis is taking one subunit, one subunit, joining them together. Lysis is taking one unit and breaking it down into two or more subunits. So that's what an enzyme does. I imagine them as little Pac-Men going meh, 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 and having a job to do in the cell. It's always a very specific job specific to that one enzyme. So some of these 
proteins will aid in transport. Maybe we need to move ions from one side of the plasma membrane to the other, inside the cell to outside or outside to inside. Maybe there's a connection to inside of the cell. Maybe we're anchoring the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton, cell skeleton, the structure of the cell, the thing that makes the shape of the cell, it's actually going to be all the way throughout the cell. We always draw cells like this, and maybe there will be a few lines representing cytoskeleton in there somewhere. This one, it's kind of vague. These little blue lines, I think, represent microtubules for our, what's called the mitotic spindle that we'll worry about later. But the fact is they're actually throughout the cell. They're anchoring everywhere. They're making the shape of the cell. So if we drew all of the cytoskeleton, we wouldn't be able to see any of the rest of this. And sometimes that cytoskeleton needs to be anchored to the plasma membrane. An example of this is in red blood cells. If you're in the blood vessels, if you're in the cardiovascular system, you are going at a very high speed. There's a lot of shearing forces. There's a lot of tearing forces, pressure forces in that environment, and you need a very thick cytoskeleton to maintain the shape of the red blood cell. So red blood cells have a cytoskeleton that is firmly anchored in the plasma membrane. Talked about enzymes. Catalytic activity is specific to breaking things down. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Some of these are going to be something called receptors, and the receptor is going to be a protein in the plasma membrane that receives a chemical signal from other cells or other body parts. And signal transduction, the passing along of signals, this is especially true in the neurons, for example, um, taking an electrical signal, releasing a chemical from the synapse, we'll learn about that later, and that's going to be released through the plasma membrane via a process known as exocytosis, which is common right up. So, again, which things can go through the plasma membrane? Does it have a protein to transport that substance? How solid is the plasma membrane there? Um, is it healthy? Does it have enough cholesterol? Concentration, gradient. Gradients are a huge concept. I think I put this on your worksheet. I wish I could draw this right now. I might have to draw something for you in PowerPoint real quick to make up for the fact that I don't have a whiteboard here with me. Here's my image. Here's what I draw on the whiteboard to represent a gradient. All this means is that a solute, a solute can be anything, an ion, a molecule, a protein, something that's floating around. If there's a whole bunch of it in one area, it's going to want to diffuse away. It's going to want to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This is going to be true even if there's a plasma membrane in the way. If there's a plasma membrane in the way, then we can actually use that gradient to power reactions. When you go downhill, down a gradient, you release energy. Like if you roll a boulder down a hill or roll a bicycle down the hill, it does not require energy that bicycle is in fact releasing potential energy as it goes down the hill. And that remains true for solutes going down a gradient. Solutes going down a concentration gradient releases energy. If there's a plasma membrane dividing an area of high concentration from an area of low concentration, we can use that gradient to power reactions. Such an important concept. If your body had no gradients, that is the definition of death. You would be dead. Our body is all about setting up gradients and using them to power reactions. That's pretty much physiology right there. If I could teach you one thing about physiology, it would be about concentration gradients. Ionic charge uh, influences membrane permeability against small nonpolar. Nonpolar means there's no charge, there's no ionic charge, net charge in a molecule, if that's what we're transporting. 
If it is large, if it is charged, it cannot go through a plasma membrane without some kind of intervention. And molecular size, again, small, nonpolar. And lipid solubility, if it is lipid soluble, it is nonpolar. These are a lot of chemistry concepts. If you have any confusion about these, feel free to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about them. Oh, my good friend, the sodium-potassium pump. Uh, I think we're getting to sodium-potassium pump a little bit prematurely, but he is an example of a transmembrane protein, a type of integral protein in the plasma membrane that does the work of pumping solutes against their gradients. So notice I use the word pump here. That means it requires cellular energy. So what we're moving is sodium and potassium. We're moving sodium in one direction and potassium in another direction. And I can tell you exactly which direction those are going in in just a minute. But they're going against their gradients. If you push a boulder uphill, that requires energy. That takes energy. That is challenging to do. If you pedal a bike uphill, that requires energy, energy input. So the unit of energy for the cell is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. When ATP is used, it becomes ADP and pi, adenosine diphosphate, and one phosphate unit that is separated from that. So it goes from having three triphosphate to two diphosphate. That's your energy unit for the cell. Here's what this looks like. I am so happy Hotline Bling came out when it did because somebody on the internet decided that his little special dance that he does looks just like the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And in fact, it does. Let's see if this is working today. Oh no, it's not working. It's an animation. Hold on just a minute. All right, I found it online, so let's watch this a couple of times. Here's Drake doing his little dance. He is going to move, let's see, do this again. He's going to move two potassium into the cytosol inside the cell. He's going to move three sodium outside of the cell, and he's going to use one ATP to do it. That is exactly what the sodium potassium ATP is pumped does. Why do we care about the sodium potassium ATPase pump in particular? The sodium potassium ATPase pump is going to come up all of the time, all over the place. It's especially going to be important when we get to neuro. Uh, the way that neurons set up their electrical potential, the change in charge between the cell side and the extracellular environment, is dependent on this pump right here. For the most part, you can study from Drake. The only medically inaccurate thing about studying from Drake for this is that he uses the ATP at the wrong time. The ATP gets used up up here before that sodium binds, or as that sodium binds, that ATP is phosphorylated, sodium moves in, potassium binds, potassium, I'm getting that backwards, sorry. Uh, potassium moves in, sodium moves out. This is poorly illustrated for this. This is the cytoplasm side. This is the extracellular fluid side. Two potassium in, three sodium out, one ATP. My apologies for saying that wrong before. So the ATP binds, the sodium is expelled out of the cell. The potassium binds on the outside and is moved inside the cell. The whole process requires one ATP. So that's just our sort of model pump. This is our model transmembrane protein that pumps ions against their gradients. Both of them are going against their gradient. Potassium has more outside, or sorry, inside the cell. Sodium has more outside the cell. They want to move down their gradients, stay this way, but the pump is going to move them against their gradients. That is the definition of active transport. Materials are moved against their concentration gradient. That requires energy from the cell. Passive transport is moving down a gradient. Some of this can be accomplished via diffusion. All diffusion is is the simple movement of molecules. Diffusion always occurs 
down a gradient. Does not require energy from the cell in passive transport because it's moving down a gradient. Here's our other way to visualize diffusion from an area of high concentration to an area of con high, low concentration. Everything behaves this way in nature, right? So ions behave this way, molecules behave this way, gases behave this way, water behaves this way. Students entering the classroom on the first day of anatomy and physiology behave this way for the most part. You know, people who don't know each other sit down kind of separated as far apart as they possibly can until they get to know each other a little bit. And then, you know, you get your two friends sitting close to each other here, two friends sitting close to each other there. But on the first day, very first day of, you know, anatomy and physiology, we get our low concentration. Everybody spreads out as much as possible. And it's a perfect illustration of diffusion. If I was looking at you guys face to face, we would be looking at the classroom and seeing if that was true for your class. All right, so passive transport. Again, simple diffusion. Sorry about that, dropped my mic. Simple diffusion is just from one area to another. Osmosis refers specifically to the movement of water. And I've got a slide coming up just for that. We're going to wait for that slide. Facilitated diffusion means it required some kind of membrane protein, still did not require ATP. And bulk filtration is a little bit different. I think we've got a slide for that. So things like small gases, oxygen gas. Oxygen gas exists as O2. It's called a diatomic molecule. You don't need to know that in here, but if you took chemistry once upon a time, that'll sound familiar. The oxygen gas moves from our air environment into our bloodstream down its gradient. Carbon dioxide moves from the blood into lungs down its concentration gradient. And the same thing happens in the tissues, but in reverse. We'll get to that. We'll worry about that more when we get to respiratory system. The fact is these very simple molecules are small enough to simply diffuse through the plasma membrane because they are small and because they are nonpolar. Osmosis, as I said, specifically refers to the diffusion of water. It's the same principle as simple diffusion. Water is going to go to a region of higher concentration. So while solutes are moving down their concentration gradients, water is going to behave to create the same effect of dilution by moving to an area of higher concentration. So solutes are moving this way. Water in this case is going to move this way. All right, so here's a classic experiment that we do to demonstrate osmosis. So let's say there's a semi-permeable membrane. It's going to be similar in nature to the plasma membrane. We're not going, we're going to assume water can get through this, but these specific solutes are too small, or sorry, too large to go through the semi-permeable membrane. If the solutes cannot go down their concentration gradient, the water is going to dilute the concentration gradient. So it's going to go to the side of the higher concentration. And at the end stage, if, if you just set this up and wait a while, you come back to it, the water level is going to rise on the side that originally had a higher concentration. So at the end of this experiment, if you take a sample from right here, for example, it's going to match the concentration that you find in this sample even though the solute could not go down its concentration gradient, the water fixed the concentration gradient by moving to the area of higher concentration. So a conceptual question to ask yourself, what is the difference between diffusion and osmosis? What is similar? This is something people mix up a lot. I used to have a visual multiple choice question on some of my exams that set this up and then gave three possibilities for what our result would be after waiting a while. Half the time people said the water level on this side is going to rise or half the sometimes they would say 
that the particles diffused across, even though it was specified that the particles cannot diffuse across this particular semi-permeable membrane. So do that exercise for yourself. I highly recommend pausing, stopping, writing this down, drawing it out, draw yourself several possibilities. Why is the water needing to dilute that solute? So in normal sort of natural circumstances, some combination of both of this is going to occur. In a normal cell, some amount of solute can go down its gradient, some amount of water can go out this way. Our body has so many mechanisms for balancing this. Some of the things that you're going to be learning about in A and P1 and 2, especially 2. So facilitated diffusion is going to be all about moving large and or polar molecules in or out of the cell. It requires a specific transport protein that assists the movement across the membrane. And this may be a simple channel or it may be something called a carrier protein. We've got pictures for that coming up. Bulk filtration is endocytosis and exocytosis. I always want you to be breaking down words. So endo refers to inside. Cyte refers to cell. Exo refers to outside. So even before you look at this definition in the next couple of slides, imagine what that might involve. So what it is is we're going to take a whole bunch of stuff into the cell and we're going to take a whole bunch of stuff and shove it outside of the cell. With adenocytosis and exocytosis, we can move solvents and solutes. So solvents are liquids. Solvents can be water or fatty uh, nonpolar solvents exist as well. For the most part, when we talk about liquids and solvents, we're talking about water in the human body. And solutes, uh, dissolved molecules, ions, stuff. Lots of forms of endocytosis. Uh, phagocytosis, phagy, this word right here, phage, that means eating. So you might imagine that this involves the cell eating something else, and it's a pretty literal eating. It takes the thing into the cell, and then it puts actual digestive enzymes on it. So we talked about enzymes, like there are little Pac-Man of the cell that have a job to do. A digestive enzyme is almost always going to break something down into simpler parts. So let's say this particle is a cellular waste or maybe it's a bacterium and we need to destroy it. The cell will undergo the version of endocytosis that's related to phagocytosis, take that thing, engulf it, take it into the cell, release it into the cell, join it with a vacuole that contains digestive enzymes and break it down and digest it. Eating. It's literally eating it. Penocytosis is nonspecific uptake of extracellular fluid. Fluid balance related to that. And receptor-mediated endocytosis engulfing of specific molecules bound to receptors on the surface of the plasma membrane. So again, um, endocytosis as a process, we're doing this in a pretty visual, simplified way to make it easy for you guys. We're not including all of the proteins that are aiding in the process of binding this vesicle to our plasma membrane and bringing it into the cell and engulfing it. So in this case, we've got stuff outside, the receptors bind to it. Part of this plasma membrane invaginates and then it pinches off and then you have your cytoplasmic vesicle and it's got stuff in it. That's our endocytosis process in a nutshell. I think I'm gonna go look for a video for you guys. Okay, I'm pretty excited about this. This cell is not messing around with this amoeba. Uh, apparently there's an amoeba and this larger structure here is the cell. You can see as it engulfs the cell, and over the course of this video, it's going to sort of tighten its grip around this little amoeba. It is not going to let it get away. 
Uh, the only difficult thing about this video is imagining this happening in three dimensions because it is going to create an entire globe around this thing as it plans to engulf it and in all likelihood destroy it. Um, amoebas are single-celled organisms. There are such things as infectious amoebas in the human body. Uh, there are sort of parasitic amoebas if you want to look at them like that. Then sometimes your body's going to need to destroy them. So in fact, if that cell's goal was to destroy that amoeba, then technically that would have been phagocytosis. But the process is going to be pretty much the same of engulfing the cell membrane surrounding the thing and bringing it into the cell. Endocytosis. Exocytosis is a very similar process, except the vesicle starts inside the cell, the cytosolic side, the cytoplasm, the intracellular environment, joins to the plasma membrane, and in this way, the plasma membrane from the vesicle simply joins the plasma membrane surrounding the cell, and the contents that were in the vesicle get extruded into the extracellular environment. That's all. Pretty easy. Lots of reasons to do exocytosis. You'll see plenty of examples. Uh, one of them, neurons releasing neurotransmitters. So again, active transport requires ATP. Again, check your understanding. Will this be transporting molecules with the gradient or against the gradient? Give you a few seconds on that. Against the gradient. So, um, ion pumps. If it says pump, it is active transport. Sodium potassium pump being our prime example of an ion pump. Endocytosis and exocytosis are both active processes as well. Bulk transport, endocytosis and exocytosis, this is largely for when we need to move large molecules, bulk structures, large amounts of stuff into or out of the cell. Something that's too large for a simple channel or carrier protein to handle. Okay, we're pretty good on that. Vesicles, if you didn't catch that, it's a package. It's a package of, it's got your phospholipid bilayer in a sphere surrounding something inside of it. That's a vesicle. A vesicle can carry pretty much anything. So again, uh, now we're finally to the cytoplasm, and the cytoplasm is the stuff, it's the fluid, it's stuff that's in the fluid, and it's organelles in the fluid. And organelles means tiny organs. I'm going to go a few more minutes, then I'm going to stop since we're changing gears here a little bit. I don't want you to have to watch more than 40-minute videos at a time. You're always welcome to pause, take breaks, uh, but, you know, long videos don't really help anybody. I think one thing that would be good to do here is watch our inner life of the cell video. I think you're going to like it.
Wasn't that absolutely beautiful? I'm hoping the audio was tolerable on that. If not, and you just uh, skipped that segment, that's called The Inner Life of the Cell. I didn't make it. Somebody awesome made it. And it's available on YouTube. There's That was the three-minute version. There's an eight-minute version. There's a version that has a voiceover, some guy telling you what all of that is. So as we go through that cytoplasm, as we go through these structures, it's a wonderful idea to watch that video, watch it again, watch it again, until you can visually understand everything that's happening. Uh, maybe you'll want to listen to the lecture first and then go back and watch the, the guy telling you what everything is, and then watch it without the, um, the voiceover and see if you can remember. That's an excellent way to practice your cell biology. My favorite is Myosin carrying the vesicle. Did you see that little walking guy? His, his name is Myosin. We're going to see myosin this semester. He's part of our muscular system. Uh, that ability to walk down a microtubule is very important, as it turns out. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here, upload it. I'm going to go eat lunch because it's about noon where I am. And I will see you guys starting at slide 38 or 39 for our next video.